It is so lovely to see you all. Uh, this is Great Decisions. It is not Human Anatomy 101 or Art History. So if you're waiting for Gardner's Art Through the Ages images to come up, that's in another place. Um, this is Great Decisions. Uh, my name is Tim DeRoche, if you don't know me. I'm the director of programs at World Oregon. I have been there, um, golly, almost 10 years. And this is one of my very, very favorite things we do every single year. And I love seeing you all show up every Friday, regardless of the topic. Um, and there are so many good topics. Um, I'm going to do a very quick announcement because Mary Carlin Yates told me if I talk more than five minutes, um, she was going to do something unspeakable. Um, and she did work for the State Department, so I won't list the things that that could include. Um, <laughs> But I do want to tell you that if you missed last week, it is up on the YouTube as we speak because we are so modern, it hurts. Um, you can go to YouTube and look up World Oregon. That's where our channel is. Uh, this will also be uh, filmed for, I say film, like we have film. Um, uh, it'll be filmed for YouTube as well. It also live streams, which means when we get to the Q&A, if you shout out questions, I'm going to ignore you as though you're not even here because you need to be on the mic because we need to be able to hear it. So I will run around the room like Oprah or Montel Williams. You can ask your questions. Um, I want to remind people when we do have questions, that means there's a question. It's 30 seconds or less. There's a question mark on it. It does not mean that you get a soapbox. You get to deliver a missive or a manifesto. And a lot of people in here, I'm sure, have strong feelings about things like, oh, diplomacy. So keep it simple. Um, the International Speaker Series, we will announce it on Monday. I was told if I even peeped a little bit of it today that I would be dragged through the streets, so I will not, um, but uh, we are damned excited. And if you have not renewed your membership, now is a good time because of course you save 10% off the cost of tickets. Um, next week, um, another prescient topic. Please join us for Elliot Young when he talks about U.S. and Mexico relations. Um, in fact, you might want to get here early. So um, we are very, very excited to have with us. This is a big treat. The kind of format we're doing, this is not, um, this is not debate team. Um, <laughs> these are two wonderful colleagues who have worked together in different parts of the world for many, many years. This is a format we haven't done before. Usually, as you know, we have, you know, a talking head standing behind a lectern with some PowerPoint and you feel like you're going to get graded on it at the end. No, it's actually, it's much better than that. But it's great to use the local resources we have. We have a number of really wonderful uh, past ambassadors and foreign service members that live in the region. Um, how many AFSA members are in the crowd today? Thank you. <laughs> that is awesome. So these are the people who have served this country in the name of diplomacy and mutual understanding. And if you get a chance and um, thank them for what they've done in the name of democracy and all this good stuff. So um, as I've said before, the topics this year in Great Decisions are some of the biggest things that are defining who we are and where we're going over the next, um, I don't know, two weeks as well as the next two decades. Um, so being able to have Mary Carlin Yates here, who is on our board of trustees, call up her old friend, Barb Stevenson, to be here and engage in a conversation on the state of the state and uh, the future of diplomacy is really, really wonderful. Um, and Barbara Stevenson is currently president of the American Foreign Service Association. She came here last night from DC I hope you get a little bit of a chance to enjoy yourself while you're here. I am enjoying it. Um, previously, she <laughs> served as Dean of the Leadership and Management School of the Foreign Service Institute. She was appointed ambassador to Panama in 2008 and later became the first female deputy chief of mission and charge d'affaires at the US Embassy in London. She has served as deputy senior advisor to the secretary and deputy coordinator for Iraq, where she was recognized with the State Department's Distinguished Honor Award for developing and implementing the civilian surge that helped improve governance and reduce violence in the region. Other, employ other appointments over a very, very distinguished career include <clears throat> serving as the American Consul General in Belfast during the North Ireland peace process, serving as Consul General and Chief of Mission in Curaçao, not a bad gig, 
um, and earlier in her career serving as special assistant to undersecretaries. We you were stuck together here. Oh, there we go. Uh, for political affairs, Peter Tarnoff and Tom Pickering covering European affairs. Mary Carlin Yates retired as a senior foreign service officer in September 2011 after 31 years with the state. Her final assignment was special assistant to the president and senior director for Africa affairs at the National Security Council. Ambassador Yates has served as US ambassador to the Republic of Ghana, ambassador to the Republic of Burundi, where she worked extensively to bring peace and stability through the Burundian peace process led by President Nelson Mandela. She also served in Kinshasa as political officer and public affairs counselor during the critical period of genocide in neighboring Rwanda. Her other assignments included Paris, Manila, Seoul, and the Department of State, Washington, D.C. She's on the board of the Atlantic Council. She's on the board of regents of OSU down in Corvallis, and we are proud to have her as one of our board of trustees. Give them a hand and come up with some good questions for them. Of course. Is my mic working? <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, thanks, Tim, for the introduction. And thank you to World Oregon, and thank you to Portland State University for hosting the Great Decisions program. It's a great program, and I said I confess I've been a Great Decisions groupie for about 40 years because I used it to study for the Foreign Service exam. Um, and whenever a young, aspiring person asks if they would, uh, what, how, what do I do to prepare for the Foreign Service, I said, read this year's Great Decisions and go back at least three years because it's the best distillation of a foreign policy issue and it gives you supplementary reading and all of that. So kudos to all of you for uh, being part of this. But let's just jump right into the topic of the day, which is the state of the State Department and American diplomacy, which I think Nick Burns just brilliantly um, outlined and, and uh, explained uh, in the essay that you have. Um, he explains that, uh, oh, and Barb and I have decided in this duo presentation, we're going to break it into three parts. What it is that diplomats do, secondly, how the work benefits Americans, and third, what are the challenges and opportunities currently facing the State Department in diplomacy? So Byrne starts out and he outlines the primary role of the Foreign Service and what it does in helping us deal with the complex issues that are out there today, whether it's climate change, rise of populism, rise of extremism, global health threats, the rise of the competing powers like China and Russia, just to name a couple. Um, he also talks about the role of the State Department. He had that historical part, both historically and today, in our national security and our prosperity. And then he outlined the four areas where he feels the Trump administration's foreign policy, he observes, is working to reverse at least seven decades of um, uh, policy that we've stood for. So Barb and I, with our 30 plus years uh, in the Foreign Service each, are we really that old? Um, <laughs> we want to take time today to bring this essay of Nick Burns a little bit to life by using examples from our own career. Um, and we also want to acknowledge and say thank you to the other for former Foreign Service officers who are in the audience. But for those of you who haven't served in an embassy, a quick Embassy 101. Embassies come in all shapes and sizes. You can have a dozen or less diplomats, or you can have over a thousand diplomats in an embassy. And you can have the agencies as small as maybe two, state and DOD, or a myriad, up to 25, 26. It's uh, commerce and agriculture and DEA and FBI. This, uh, some of the embassies in Paris and uh, Iraq places are just huge. The ambassador is called a chief of mission overseas because you are the president's represented, nominated by the White House, approved by the Senate, um, and when you're overseas, you represent all of those agencies, or the, you're the chief of mission for all of those agencies. Um, Nick's article details that the embassies overseas exist and they have historically to represent U.S. interests. And many people don't understand that. Why is that? Because the world beyond our borders here really profoundly affects things at home. You know, things that happen overseas can bring war and peace here. They can take jobs away from Oregonians. Um, they can even invade our cyberspace. So 
Now if I can just turn to a few minutes about myself, what a unique thing. Um, as a Foreign Service Officer, we all enter, we call it entry level, and that's like the military. And then you work your way up the ranks after one di diplomatic tour after another, one posting after another. We're a core of only about 8,000 highly trained men and women who have both experience and expertise <clears throat> on foreign policy issues. Um, we're trained to speak the local language. We're trained to uh, live and understand the local culture. Um, and so that we can advance US political security and economic and cultural issues by living and breathing with the people of that country. My diplomatic lessons started when I studied Korean for 20 months, and that was hard on my brain, before taking up my first posting in South Korea in the early 80s. Korea was a key ally, but it was run by a, an authoritarian regime, so the young people were protesting. They wanted freedom, they wanted democracy. So the fact that I could speak the language, and I was a little bit younger at the time, um, I was able to communicate. And then I took the lessons from that onto the Philippines, where the Korea Aquino People Power Revolution had just happened. So there was a, a, a lot of ex, uh, experience I had that I took with me. I also like to say that was my best assignment because I met my husband there and married him, a fellow diplomat. Um, we were working hard on basis talks late into the night. Um, <laughs> My, 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 but my assignments were rarely cushy ones, um, like my time in the war zone in Central Africa's Burundi. Um, and, and I did learn negotiating sp skills from watching Nelson Mandela. What, what a magic man. And I was able to take those lessons with me, um, especially when I went to work as a foreign policy advisor for the US military. And I said I had to earn the respect of both the uh, officers and enlisted, and then they would treat me with respect so we could work strategically on both state and DOD goals. Um, and also, I mean, I think when any of you who've been diplomats know, you have to de deliver tough messages for the US. And I was able to do that with a couple of African presidents that I think help with the safety and security of people back home. Um, and then just uh, to, to finish, uh, one thing that wasn't mentioned was after I was working at the White House and I did need all of that experience to work with the National Security Council and bring the interagency together and come up with policy options. But then President Obama asked me to go to Khartoum as Chargé, and I was there exactly when uh, South Sudan was born, I say, from the loins of, of Sudan. And that was, at the end of my whole career, one of the most challenging assignments um, and fascinating. Anyway, I hope what I've said is practicing diplomacy is complicated, it's exciting, and sometimes it's heartbreaking. And I bet you you have a few stories too, Barb. Well, I do. I mean, of all the places for me to get to start my diplomatic career, I began it in Panama covering um, human rights and counter-narcotics under the regime of General Manuel Antonio Noriega. So as a general, general, yeah, junior officer tour goes, it was up there. And then after that, I learned Dutch for a posting in the Netherlands, and that's where our daughter was born. But I missed the excitement, right, of Central America, so I volunteered to go back to El Salvador, where I worked on bringing the left back in from the cold to run in the assembly elections, which didn't sound like such a big deal until it completely tipped the balance and prepared the way for the peace agreement that came nine months later and brought an end to that terrible civil war in El Salvador. So I got to work on the peace agreement as well. And then I came back to Washington to figure that out. I was the junior United Kingdom desk officer. So like most Foreign Service officers, I spent over two-thirds of my career posted abroad, mostly to embassies and capitals, but um, as Tim mentioned, also in consulates. So I was in um, Curaçao, um, Willemstad Curaçao, which is the capital of the Netherlands Antilles. There are islands off the shore of Venezuela and, and Colombia. And that was where we established two forward operating locations after we lost our bases in Panama. We were trying to launch Plan Columbia, and drugs were pouring in to the south of the United States across the Caribbean, and we established the capability there to shut down that traffic. It moves. That's the bad part about drug trafficking. You shut it down in the Caribbean, it moves to the Eastern Pacific. You shut it down in the Eastern Pacific, it moves to the Isthmus. So that's where we are now. And in Belfast, I had the great honor of further bedding down that peace agreement that America gets so much credit for after the visionary leadership of Senator Mitchell. 
So as I tell members of Congress, no matter where your constituents, you know, no matter why your constituents find themselves abroad, whether they're there to adopt a baby, study abroad, climb a mountain, build a house for habitat, on a mission for their church, looking at mitigating climate change, they've got a home base called the American Embassy. And it's staffed with fellow Americans like me, who also happen to speak the local language after months of hard work, if not years, and to understand how, uh, who the players are and how to get stuff done in that country. So from moving goods in and out to communicating over you know, not very good communications lines to um, convening the right people to tackle a problem or expand a business um, to just actually being able to travel up country during the rainy season and come back home to tell about it. So the group of people I represent, the American Foreign Service, we run the platforms, the embassies around the world. So we maintain an enduring presence in all but four countries in the world. And so we operate 273 embassies and consulates all around the world. And that's more than any other country still, although China is closing in with 268 at last count. So there we are. So Americans at home benefit, though, from what we do also, though in ways sometimes that are less obvious. So let me just get all of you to think for a second. Um, how many of you have, in the last decade or so, taken a trip to London or Paris or Dublin or any other city in Europe? That's what I thought. It's world affairs, people. It's global order. So, if you think about that, when you were on the tarmac waiting to take off, the officials at PDX already knew the identities of every person on that plane with you. They had able to pre-screen and to decide that the, what kind of a risk that profile that they had to be able to mitigate it either before the plane took off or at the border. And it was um, American diplomats working with our customs and border protection colleagues at, the, at embassies around Europe negotiated for years with the European Union to get that agreement in place that allows us to exchange passenger name records. And this is one of the things diplomats do. It's not that obvious, but we're the ones who create and build these agreements and then service them that allow a lot of law enforcement and counterterrorism information to be shared back and forth. And that allows us to travel safely and to keep threats at bay. So that's one of the things that we do. I'm going to go a little philosophical with you. <laughs> Why do you need to come to a World Oregon event at Portland State University to hear in person what America's diplomats do for you? Think about it, right? In part, it's because when our work is done well, it is nearly invisible, right? So unlike the military, our work doesn't produce these really cool action shots with tanks and missiles and ships and people with parachutes. None of that, right? And unlike the military, um, and my son who's in ROTC, we don't even have spiffy uniforms. <laughs> we what we have, <laughs> what we have is just is people, and they're highly skilled at building up relationships with people that we count on around the world. So everybody knows you can count on our military to keep us safe, but you also count on diplomats to keep you safe. And the national security strategy that we are currently operating under, published in December of 2017, does a great job of summarizing the central task of diplomats. And I'd like to just read these three, few sentences Somebody to you. Somebody else had to have written it. <laughs> Our diplomats must be able to build and sustain relationships. Relationships developed over time create trust and shared understanding that the United States calls on when confronting security threats, responding to crises, and encouraging others to share the burden for tackling the world's challenges. End of the quote. So when a crisis hits or an opportunity appears, we in the Foreign Service draw on all these relationships that we have cultivated over the years, and we respond to the crisis or we seize the opportunity. Because we maintain this enduring presence, because we live and work and break bread every day in Panama and Northern Ireland and Ghana and El Salvador, we have real relationships with people in those countries. So when an Ebola crisis breaks out in West Africa, we know who to work with on the ground in Ghana and Sierra Leone to um, create the bridgehead that allows us to send in reinforcements and contain that crisis. 
because we live and work in Panama, we know how to have the right conversations with the banking industry so that we reduce the space for money laundering and corruption. And because we're in Northern Ireland, we know how to ask people to take a risk for peace with the promise that we'll stand by them if we do, if they do. So American diplomats. Well, I think what, what you're saying is the American presence there is really important. It is. And whether we're working on a foreign policy issue, a development issue, something purely diplomatic. But what happens when we're not there? That is such a great question. Former Secretary of State George Shultz used to say that diplomacy was a bit like gardening. You have to tend to it every day and water, or you know what happens when you go away for six months and you come back. Goodness, it's not your garden anymore. And maybe the, one of the books I want to recommend that's in the back of the Nick Burns' reading list in here is The Jungle Grows Back. Take a look at it. The metaphor is still strong. I heard former Congressman yeah. Ed Royce, who was the Republican chairman of the House <clears throat> Foreign Affairs Committee until he retired in, before this last elections. He raised this at the beginning of a hearing, and I was present to hear him talk about this. He talked about um, how Boko Haram, the group that's most best known for um, kidnapping the, the schoolgirls in Nigeria, how they emerged seemingly out of nowhere. And he said, you know how that happened? We closed the American consulate in Kaduna, Nigeria, and then we had no eyes and no ears on the ground, so we didn't see when Gulf money poured in, when madrasas opened up, and when teenage boys started to walk out of those doors wearing bin Laden t-shirts. The consequences of not having the Foreign Service there is real. And I have to say it sounds dramatic, but I know exactly what he means, and I can tell you if you want in question and answer, well, if you'd been there with three other people, what would you have done? I'll tell you exactly what we'd have done and why that would have never happened. So there are real consequences. When we're not there, the jungle grows back, and bad people who don't share our interests and values move in, and they take over, and the consequences are real. So I think you've dealt well with um, taking care of helping Americans think about what diplomats do overseas to bring them security. But the other part of this, I think, is prosperity. You know, in this uh, second rubric, we're talking about how it helps Americans at home. And I really want to compliment, um, I don't know how many of you get, you probably don't, the uh, Foreign Service Journal. That is, if you're an AFSA member, I'm not here as a paid agent of this lady. But um, what is so amazing about the one this month is it's called uh, about economic diplomacy. And sometimes it's so easy to think about security issues and peace and, and you know those problems. But economic diplomacy is really important as well. And we have in an embassy, you have economic officers, and we also, if you're fortunate, have a Commerce Department officer, and their job is to help American businesses. You can help American businesses by helping promote what it is they're selling. You can help them, more importantly at times, establishing the rules so that, that uh, people are on an uh, even and fair playing field, and so uh, that it, it's better to promote how Americans do business than uh, follow some other models. And I said, one of the interesting statistics in one of these articles is that 80% of the global purchasing power now lies outside the United States. And there are also several large emerging markets where their annual GDP is twice that of the United States. So we need, as Americans and American businesses, to be in those markets. Um, and actually, I just did a little uh, reading that uh, Oregon exports grew from 10 billion in 2003 to 21 billion in 2017, and export-related jobs here in Oregon from 49,000 up to 67, 76,000 in this same period. This is according to the Global um, Cities Initiative statistics. And, and kudos to the people in Portland, and I know many of you know this better than I do, this strategic planning that is uh, done in the document Greater Portland 2020, they actively promote enticing foreign direct investment here into Oregon. And that has manifested itself in Adidas and the uh, Daimler trucks, um, and also Intel basing their North American headquarters here in Portland. So 
Kudos to the people in Oregon who worked on this, but the point is diplomats in those embassies overseas did a whole lot of heavy lifting too to make these things happen. And I'm not either an economist or a foreign commercial specialist, but fortunately we have one in the audience and you're lucky to have him in Portland. Um, Scott uh, Godin, who's going to be your speaker, I believe on February 15th and the topic decoding US-China uh, trade relations. He will probably give you chapter and verse about the challenges of trying to take on China in these competitive markets overseas and here um, at home. And you know, I know when I was ambassador in Ghana, we had many um, trade delegations come to visit there, and then I was fortunate to take a group in a sister city relations, a trade delegation of Ghanaians to business uh, exhibition in uh, Atlanta. But what we try and do is help small and medium-sized businesses, and we work with cities and states. And um, I, I think that what we're seeing is the US companies are facing more and more competition. And yesterday's companies and yesterday's philosophies and management and strategies just simply won't prevail. And it's not going to be enough to complain uh, and invoke that there are trade barriers or we have to justify ultimately. This is not going to work as a winning strategy. And I, I, I'm not going to talk about uh, China much, but their Belt and Road Initiative that we have seen happen in Africa and other places, this is a long-term goal. And what they do is they China uses a aggressive financing, they promote Chinese companies, um, they are uh, state-owned or state-subsidized, and it's very hard for U.S. companies and the U.S. government to compete with this. You know, one personal note is when I started out in the diplomatic corps in Africa and you would meet Chinese diplomats and you always had a very nice Chinese meal at their home, but they rarely spoke the local language, maybe but not having a real conversation. They uh, sometimes covered two or three countries. Well, not anymore. They have huge embassies. They speak the local language beautifully, plus English. And so, I mean, we're in a big competitive world. I mean, does that track with sort of what you're seeing? Boy, it really does, Mary. And it's not just quality. It's also just the quantity side. I mean, some of my uh, fellow Foreign Service officers are reporting back that um, in Sub-Saharan Africa in particular, that the, um, they're outnumbered five to one in terms of um, diplomats that are working on economic and commercial issues. China's got five in the field for every one of them. And of course, they're armed with um, very serious financing. Oh, so yeah. there's that. And the big picture story of aggregate spending tells a similar story. It's not easy to get these figures, but we got the, this one set since 2013. China has increased spending on diplomacy by 40%. And has anybody got any guesses on what happened to spending on Mer America's core diplomatic capacity over the same period? It fell by a third. It fell by a third. So when you look at those simple numbers, Chinese spending on diplomacy up by 40%, America spending on core diplomatic capability down by a, a third over the same period, it's easy. You start to understand what's going on and why you're getting these stories from the field about being so out, out, outmanned, if you'll pardon the gender reference. You know, and Congress is worried about this, too. Um, since um, the end of March, they've held a dozen hearings on the rising threat from, from, from China and about China just you know, gaining commercial and economic and political ground at our expense. And indeed, it is the key issue in the national security strategy, as Nick Burns' um, final essay called Challenges Ahead points out, is after a 15, 18 years of focusing post 9-11 on counterterrorism, what are we pivoting to realize what happened while we were focused on that? Yes, it's the rise of authoritarian powers. It's great power competition is back, and it's Russia and China. So I often turn to baseball when I'm up on the hill talking to members of Congress about what this feels like out there. You know, it's like we're in a baseball stadium, and it's a lovely stadium with the best security money can buy, but the American team sort of ran out of money before we, you know, could pay for the second base and shortstop person, and China is at bat, and they are just knocking them down the hole and running the bases. And the first thing we need to do is just get somebody on second base and shortstop. Our <laughs> embassies are understaffed for some very complicated reasons having to do with, remember, the surge that I delivered for Iraq? 
guess what, I, where I got all those diplomats to go to Iraq. Africa. Economic officers from Africa and Latin America. And we never, we never replaced those positions. It is time to do it. There are all kinds of ways we can respond to this. But first off, <laughs> cover second base and shortstop so we can at least play the game fairly. OK, that, fair enough. I love that analogy. But I, I mean, one thing we've been talking about a long time uh, in my career was diplomatic spending versus defense spending. <laughs> And it is something I go at carefully because, like Mary, I've had some of my best partnerships have been with DOD. But it is just no question that U.S. defense spending, it's over $700 billion. It's over $750 billion this year, I believe. It is more than 10 times what Russia spends. It's more than the next 8 to 10 countries combined. So our spending on defense, there's no trend line in which somebody is eclipsing us. Like, forget about that. That's not what's happening there. It is still an overwhelming um, amount of money being spent there. So $700 billion a year for DOD, plus a separate military construction budget and a separate budget for Veterans Affairs. It takes you to about a trillion if you put them all together. It's a lot of money. So what do we spend on core diplomacy each year? It's under $5 billion. Now, even if we include everything in, like, you know, the diplomatic construction, because we're responsible for building the embassies and maintaining the platform and securing it, you're looking at about $20 billion a year. The entire budget for foreign affairs is $54 billion and includes a whole bunch of money that goes to Israel and Jordan and Egypt and the United Nations, and it goes to $10 billion for PEPFAR. When you get down to what we spend on diplomacy, core diplomacy is under $5 billion a year. Does anybody know how much we spend each year supporting Afghan forces? $5 billion a year. So there we are. So we don't spend much on diplomacy. We spend a lot on the military. And when you compare American diplomatic spending against either rising powers or kind of Britain and France, I mean, it's not even like double. It's just a, it's a very low amount that we spend on this. There has been a narrative out there of runaway spending on diplomacy. We did a lot of work to take a good look at this and, and validate for Congress that spending on core diplomatic capability, if it was a dollar in 2008, it fell to 77 cents by 2016. Those are important years politically. You can all do it in your heads. But the story that the spending on diplomacy soared under the last period is not validated by publicly available budget justifications. I'm passionate about this. If you don't fund us, we will not fill second base and shortstop. OK, Barbara, <laughs> the, I, I'm, I'm watching our time, too, because we said we're going to give them 20 minutes to ask questions. And you know we could be talking all afternoon here. Um, so the third segment, which is the state of State Department and diplomacy, and Barb does this on the Hill all the time. I've been retired a few years, so I'm going to hand this baton back to her. But also, as the AFSA president, this is the work she does for the Career Foreign Service. So have at it. Hit it out of the park. So that is the kind of the issue, and Nick Burns does a great job of it in your Great Decisions booklet. So I encourage you to read that. Nick and I did this together in the Boston Public Library last February. But so we've already talked about a long-term downward trend in core diplomatic capability. And then, as I sometimes say, the black swan landed in 2017. And I still keep the Washington Post um, uh, front page there, which has a 33% proposed cut to the State Department, which is the first thing we faced in, in, in 2017. Secretary of State Tillerson then came in and assumed that such deep cuts would be passed and made a primary focus of his time in office reducing staffing at the State Department. And so he moved at this with a focus that is quite remarkable, and he nearly achieved his long-term goals. So by the time that Congress, which rejected the cuts as a doctrine of retreat, finally got our funding bill passed in March of um, 2018, they ordered the Secretary of State, which was by now not Secretary Tillerson but Mike Pompeo, shall resume hiring, shall stop the staffing cuts, shall report to Congress. By the time they did that, um, a lot of damage had been done. To Secretary Pompeo's credit, he and the State Department have moved with as much speed as they can to unstick the gears and to try to get it turning again, to bring on new diplomats, to resume hiring. But there has been serious, serious damage done to our senior ranks. Um, we have lost some really 
talented people who you just don't grow somebody like Joe Yun overnight. So um, that was our North Korea expert. His wife is here with us. Joe is in, in Korea now. But you don't grow four-star generals overnight. So our leadership ranks are, are weakened, they're depleted, and that affects America's ability to lead globally. Can you do a little more on those numbers? I mean, when we talked about like the equivalent of a four-star general, a three-star general, you know, what we had and what we lost in that year under Tillerson's time, it's dramatic. It's dramatic. Um, we started um, 2017 with six four-star generals in the diplomatic service and Equivalent, um, though, yeah. equivalents. They're called career ambassadors with big C and big A. Um, by the time Secretary Tillerson left, we had two left and the other two are, both are gone. We started off with 33 three-star equivalents. They're called career ministers and we were down to about 15. <laughs> And we lost about 20% of our two stars as well. So our, our top ranks, it's a highly competitive process to get there. You have got to be some kind of an American diplomat to reach those ranks. So it's kind of like wiping out the Jedis. <laughs> so how do we rebuild? So you know, Mary, it takes decades to grow a general. So um, it's a competitive system. It's up or out like the military. I think the thing that we have most going for us is that our mid-ranks, are, so, are strong. They're robust and they're healthy. I think the most important thing that we need to do now is get this record number of vacancies overseas and back in Washington in policy positions, they need to be filled. Fill the vacancies, fully staff the embassies. Today, we will then benefit immediately from having a full team on the field so China's not just running the bases through the hole in it. But it's also the best way to grow a diplomat for the future is to ask a diplomat to do a hard job to stretch, take responsibility, and show global leadership. That's how you build the leadership bench for tomorrow. We need to get on this. Absolutely. Um, I want to try and pull this together. And um, I know when you talk to Congress, you give them all sorts of examples. Um, and our former colleague who then went to work for uh, UPS, uh, let's share that story and then let them have at us for questions, okay? One of our colleagues, Laura Lane, who some people know because she's one of the heroes of the Rwanda evacuation. She was on my team in the operations center. She is now the president for global affairs at UPS. And she talks about the challenge that UPS faces every time they're trying to bring a package into, across the border, into a country. They face one qu request after another for a bribe and they can't pay bribes. American companies are subject to the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, so they can't pay bribes. And so, what does UPS do? Do they just go, oh well, you'd have to pay bribes in this country, so I'll just pack up and go home and cede the field to China? Not Laura. Laura said, let me work with the American Embassy in this country, and this country, and this country. Let us get the, um, let us go in and make the case to the host government, let's say the Ghanaians or the government of Sierra Leone, that they want to adopt a trade facilitation agreement, the one that was approved by the World Trade Organization. So they do. They approve it, and the friction at the border drops way down. And of course, as Laura likes to say, as soon as you put the put this online, and it's an automated online process, bit streams don't ask for bribes. So our companies are not faced with the need to pay, bribe, to pay bribes, so the packages flow in. So this is a real win for UPS, but it's also a huge win in the country, in Sierra Leone or Ghana or wherever this is, because whenever you're shrinking the space for corruption, you're growing the, the space for decent, hardworking people to have a fair shake at making an honest living for their lives. And so it's one of the biggest wins wins that we can do. So it has development potential, but it is also, it's so important that we make it possible for American companies to stay in the field because if we seed this field, we're gonna seed it to somebody else and we're not gonna ever get it back. And Barb spends a lot of time on Capitol Hill lobbying for uh, diplomats and the Foreign Service, and I argue for all of us. Um, I think something we can all do, I mean, Oregon has some outstanding uh, Senate and, and congressional leadership. 
I think we can reach out and let them know because actually the Senate, by the action they took on the budget of 20, that we finally got in 2018, that it was restored. I mean, they said we have, can't have a doctrine of, of retreat. We can ask our Congress uh, to continue to support the Foreign Service and to grow it um, so the diplomats are out there defending America. Anyway, I would now like to turn it over. I said 20 up, not bad. <laughs> See, big government isn't so bad. You actually got done on time, and you've got a question. First of all, thanks both of you for your service um, and for coming here, but especially for, for the service you've given to our country. Um, I am actually quite concerned about the future of the Foreign Service, and I appreciate your saying that the middle ranks are strong, and, and they are. My concern is about the junior ranks, and I would like your comments on whether you are getting a large number of top quality young people who are still interested in going in the Foreign Service. As a teacher here at PSU, I'm finding that more and more young people are feeling that they they don't want to represent the United States overseas at this point in history. So I'd like to hear your comments. So I did just actually put in a request for the numbers of applicants to the Foreign Service Officer Test because I did write uh, a, a little over a year ago, I wrote a column and noted that fewer people were signing up for the test. So I worry about this. So I do worry about this trend. It's something that's on my mind and I think that it is it, the Foreign Service needs to remain the first option for somebody who is, um, cares about foreign affairs and American leadership. We only bring in about 275 diplomats a year. If we were trying to bring in a whole lot, it would be a different story, but I've actually met with our industrial psychologist to discuss this matter, and he said, of all of my clients, they have to worry about this, but you have always had something like 20,000 people competing for the 300 slots each year in the Foreign Service. And because you bring in so few and your, your core is so small, you alone among my clients are still in good shape because we could go two or three times as deep into the rank order register of people who passed the test and they would still be fully qualified. So does it mean I don't worry about this? No. Does it mean I'm complacent? No. Does it mean I'm going to take back what you've just told me? Yes. But it, it also just, I want to say, the, the entry ranks still look good because we just need 300 patriots a year, and we get lots more than that still trying to come in. And I would just add that, I mean, with the passing of George Bush this year, we had uh, an example of someone who was an extraordinary public servant. And I think he's the example, or he's an example, to be held up to young people today that there is real reward in doing public service, you know? And, you know, I was reading an article in one of the journals that said, it's a time to buy low, you know? I mean, and, and you know, come in the Foreign Service and think of the career you're going to have. I mean. There, there are decades ahead if you're just starting your career. So, And anyone who works with young people, I would encourage them to apply or do something in public service. Um, before I hand off a question, I was, I was going to say that um, even in our office at World Oregon, I would say when I started there, um, about 50% to two-thirds of the people coming in who were interns were people very, very interested in foreign service and taking the foreign service exam. The other fraction were people who were involved or interested in international development. And we have watched, I think, the foreign service piece move back over and more people wanting to work for NGOs and not for government. And that's, it's a good barometer, I think, for understanding where people are in the world. And Shut down and help a bit. So going back to the first section that you guys mentioned, um, what is it that diplomats do? I was wondering what uh, an instance such as the government shutdown would have, like how that would affect uh, the Foreign Service's ability to respond to crises and stuff around the world. Barbara, if you take that, because you're back there in the thick of it, and at least we have some good news as of 10.30 or something. So most of our embassies were declared um, accepted and were told to go to work without pay. So the embassies <laughs> stayed open, and we continued to issue visas and um, 
you know, passports to American citizens, et cetera. So it's been an unusual shutdown. It's just been doing it through molasses because, you know, none of the systems that you rely on are actually up and running. And so everything's got to work around, around, a work around. And then before you can do it, you have to go right back to Washington and run it through the lawyers. And the lawyers have to decide if during a shutdown this is actually allowed to be done or not. And can this person whose wife is about to uh, pass the, the mark in which she can travel back to the United States to deliver their first baby, can we make an exception for her to do temporary duty travel or do, it's, that's what we have spent like the last month doing. And I can tell you that a great nation that spends all of its time on that sort of thing is one that, you know, doesn't, it, it's not good for American global leadership. One of my colleagues told me a story of being in a country in Africa and they, uh, it's one that we have spoken to strongly and firmly about the need for good governance and honoring democratic outcomes, et cetera, and that they um, sarcastically uh, launched a GoFundMe campaign online for the American <laughs> embassies they could pay salaries. I can tell you that when we're being laughed at abroad, it is harder to lead. So there's all of that. And I would like to just think, how many of you in this room have ever hosted an international visitor? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. This is one of those programs that ostensibly remained opened and funded, except it is so full of glitches as you keep trying to bring in your visitors. It's an example of, I know that the various organizations are struggling because their funding's held up and they've got bills to pay and it's not being paid. So it does affect us. What we did was we said we would do things that were supposed to deal with, you know, life and safety. So there's all kinds of exceptions. So you're sort of keeping the lights on, and, but you are not able to really project much leadership. So I, I kept saying it's not going to be lack of diplomacy that causes the shutdown to end. It will be when Americans cannot fly safely from Washington to Portland. Well, that's and exactly what happened. I, yeah. is that, thank you. Yes, yeah. <laughs> that's where we yeah. Yesterday down. when we heard that and we heard the head of the stewardesses organization saying you're not going to be able to fly safely and people can't get the Super Bowl and hey, voila, <laughs> things change. I want to say one more thing about that. If there's, there are so many issues that divide our country. They divide us to the point that we are just shut down and unable to govern ourselves. There is one issue that consistently comes up with agreement, and that is support for America's global leadership role. It's over, more than nine in 10 Americans support our global leadership role. I think much of that comes from pondering the question, if we don't lead, who will? But they support America's global leadership role. I got to tell you what, when you're sitting there trying to project leadership and there's a GoFundMe campaign to keep the lights on, this is very, it, 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 we are not supporting that global leadership role. It is so hard to build it, to build up this credibility, this bank accounts of trust, and boy, you can run through it pretty fast through something like this. Uh, in deference to Tim's exhortation early on, I'll, I'll uh, mask an editorial comment in a question. <laughs> Um, and, and riffing off your last point, um, not only are youth not joining uh, or, or seemingly turned away from uh, working in the Foreign Service, but I would, I would venture to guess that the foreign policy establishment is running largely in the opposite direction uh, from this administration. Um, my question is, really gets to the, without any inference to a deep state, uh, how the diplomatic corps is able to uh, maintain their credibility with foreign counterparts uh, because of the obvious gap in talent, leadership, credibility of, of the folks we're sending out. And I just take the example of Pompeo and Bolton's recent trip and any statements that they have made that then have been turned around quickly by whatever the president tweeted that morning. So there, there is a gap. I think our allies understand there's a gap. Uh, as, you, as you observed with the president's budget and then Congress ignoring that as they did on most everything, um, you know, are you able to continue your good work by virtue of you know, people not paying attention to the noise and really dealing with the reality. I just want to say one thing, and I'm not the best person to answer this because you're in Washington, 
but I may have more freedom to say what I truly believe because I'm no longer in the US government. In the first year of this administration, I made a specific point to go and have coffee every time I went to Washington. I'm still working on some things on Sudan. And I would go in and have coffee with three or four people and just to check the temperature and to see how, I mean, it was in this period of Tillerson's time when uh, it was just being decimated, I mean, the, the senior ranks. Um, but on the specific question about how about your leadership role, there is even, you know, the, the layer above the top leadership, you know, the French counterpart, the German counterpart, whatever would call and say, we're supposed to be at this meeting. Um, are you going to be able to come? Uh, what's your agenda item? So there were workarounds, you know, in that first year to still be advancing uh, the points because they wanted American leadership on whatever the agenda issues were. I can't give you that snapshot now because, I mean, I haven't been there uh, as much in the last six or eight months. But, um, I mean, I, th I think it's having a profound effect on our leadership in the world. But I think that people want our leadership and therefore uh, some of our closer allies will still turn to the people who are filling the seats even though there's a whole layer. I hear the seventh floor of the State Department where most of our senior people are is just sort of moribund up there. I mean, it's vacant. Vacant. Most yeah. of it's vacant. So. Just one quick comment. As of 21 minutes ago, there's a deal on the shutdown being ended. All right. So that's why. The question I have is raw numbers of China versus the U.S. You gave some percentage increases. How, and I, it's probably hard to really do apples to apples comparison. It is. How large is the funding that China has for diplomacy and the numbers of people versus us? You know, it's a great question, and it's one that we did a partnership with the University of Texas at Austin to try to actually do comparisons. And you know what? You can spend, you can have some great graduate students spend months trying to get at that and come out with still not much. And that was why when I gave those <laughs> figures, I said it's really hard to get these. We ended up with none on Russia, just none, no matter how much research we did. China, they were bragging about it, and, and it was published. And that was where we were able to get what the trend lines are. But you are right. Ours is a public budget. In an authoritarian state, it's not a public budget. So no, we don't actually have that. And it's really hard to get at it. It really is hard to get at it. So what you do is you just have embassies go around and say, OK, how big is this? And then you get back, OK, in my country, you know, that we have 0.5, because we've got somebody who's covering you know, consular work, and, and they have got a team of you know, five, and they have, you know, they've got all the ports, they've got all the roads, and that's what we're seeing. But you're absolutely right. Those are the questions we've been trying to get at. They're kind of not knowable because it's classified, because you're dealing with authoritarian states. Hi, uh, Kim Olson. I'm a former Foreign Service officer. Um, interested to know your perspective on the situation in Venezuela and the administration's choice to not pull the diplomats out and what AFSA's role is like if the diplomats don't agree. So we were wrestling with that yesterday morning and then we uh, figured out that there was going to be um, an ordered departure message which has now gone out and so most the vast majority of the embassy and the families are doing an order of departure today Explain and in the coming what that days. Means for an order of departure is a decision but taken by the Secretary of State to order diplomats, American diplomats in a country to leave. And so we have authorized departures, which means if you're scared, you can leave. If you're worried, you can <laughs> leave. And then we have ordered. We're not asking you what you think about how important your mission is. We are telling you to go. So that went into effect uh, yesterday afternoon. And so there will be. We will not close the embassy. Our Chargé Jimmy story will stay there with the Marines and the RSOs. Others is not public who all is with him, but many of our diplomats are actually leaving Venezuela now. I've been a human resource consultant with uh, some minor assignments at the Department of Homeland Security and the Office of Naval Research. And I've also worked for large cor corporations and the culture of the organization is really important in determining whether people will stand up for what they believe versus what it takes to get along and, 
and get ahead. And I wondered how you would characterize the State Department and what is being done, if anything, consciously to get people to do what is best for the country, not necessarily what is best for their careers? Well, that's a great question to ask to the person in my role, the president of the American Foreign Service Association, because we actually, our big annual award ceremony is um, for, uh, we give out uh, three or four awards for constructive dissent. So we actually, this year, our undersecretary for political affairs, David Hale, who's mentioned in the uh, article that Nick Burns wrote, presented the award for a senior officer for constructive dissent to outgoing undersecretary for political affairs. This is the senior career job in the Foreign Service, right there. Uh, he gave it to Tom Shannon, so the current undersecretary of political affairs to the outgoing secretary, undersecretary of political affairs. He was the recipient of the constructive dissent award on temporary protected status being lifted. And so we created a forum for this. Um, it, all kinds of people come. It's a well-attended event. It gets written up. So we do actually recognize it, celebrate it, train it, talk about what constructive dissent looks like. Um, so it is something that we, we say that we're, that's a big part of where our value added comes from. You have to count on us, Mr. Secretary and political appointees, to call it like we see it. Now that is, you know, not that, that it's everybody, you know, is following their academic freedom to do what they want because that way lies chaos. But we need to be able to read the foreign environment, tell you, call it like we see it, this will fly, that doesn't have a chance, but if you did it this way, we think it would work. That's our job. We're not of much use to you if we're not doing that. So we celebrate that, that virtue and we keep it alive. Um, yeah, you talked about, or, uh how is the current administration doing uh, in terms of filling appointments that are traditionally or typically political appointments versus career appointments? It's lagging really on both. It's lagging on yeah. both. That is really when we look at the numbers, there's just, there's a lag. The, um, yeah, I mean, in huge accounts, you know. Um, and then you have to ask yourself, why is it that we don't have an ambassador in Saudi Arabia? Why is it we don't have an ambassador in some of these places? I'm just going to let that question rest. Oh, wait a minute. Well, you, yeah. uh, I'm currently reading the book by Ronan Farrow, A War on, uh, excuse me, War, war on Peace. Peace, excuse me. And uh, I was just wondering uh, your, your thoughts on how accurate uh, that details uh, the current state of diplomacy uh, in the U.S. Did you read it? I haven't read it, so I get to bow out of that one. So I will say, I you know, Foreign about. Service officers are a kind of a notoriously finicky group, and we like to get our facts exactly right. And so you will get groups that go, and no, no, I was in the room for that meeting, and that part was not quite right. So there is some little skirmishing about some of the details, but I think Ronan Farrow did a great job of painting the larger arc here, which is an under-reliance on diplomacy, a starving of the capability, not putting it front and center. And I think that his, his storyline merges beautifully with the final points that Nick Burns is making here, which is that we're going back to great power struggles now. The people who, you've got to get diplomacy up and strengthened and, and to be able to go in, to, it's the most cost effective way by a country mile to maintain America's global leadership. So I think that there are quibbles in the details about some of Ronan Farrow, but I think he made it accessible and interesting. And I think that the arc that he describes of a general decline is an important one and it's the one that I'm hoping that all of you will come out going, this must be arrested. <laughs> follow up on an earlier question a moment ago about dissent. Um, my understanding is that there is a formal back channel within the State Department for people who have significant either moral or intellectual qualms uh, with what is being decided at upper levels and that there is a formalized route to get information from bottom to top. Uh, is, how is the traffic on that route being quantified and monitored and tended to uh, on behalf of the 
lower downs in the Foreign Service who, in my experience, are extremely bright and uh, morally and intellectually competent people. Uh, how, how are those concerns being heard and, and acted upon? So there is something called the dissent channel. And it is from in any embassy. You can send it per dissent channel. It goes as a cable, as we call it, back to the director of policy planning, who then makes a recommendation to the Secretary of State. And it was created during the Vietnam War so that people on the ground who said, no, no, this actually isn't working. You know, we're, we're winning the battles, but we're losing the war. It was created in that context to be able to point out, I'm here, I live here, I see the ground truth. This actually isn't working. And it served that purpose, I think, very well for a long time. If the problem is that you don't have anybody on, OK, there, there is a, so you can, you are specifically prohibited from raising resource issues in the dissent channel. Mm -hmm. So if your primary problem is that you're outmanned five to one, and you haven't had a second baseman and a shortstop since the first round of the Iraq tax, you actually are, it's not an appropriate vehicle to say, we do not have the team that we need to avoid being massacred in this baseball game. So it's not working for that purpose. It worked really well for what it did. But it's about policy disputes that assume a lot of resources, great American power, and we need to use it the right way. And we need, it's, it's not quite right for what we're facing today. Did, did that answer about the, no, the lower? Uh, the, uh, the they, they aren't sending, they, yeah, they're, they're just, OK, go ahead. This is the wrong decision, the policy decision, yeah. Exactly. yeah. That's, that's the question. So uh, the junior diplomats then could possibly, bravely, send in something in the dissent channel. I haven't seen it happen, so it's just yeah. a hypothetical. I, and I think I probably really most people would figure as long as they work so hard to get in, they might be risking something. When you were describing some of the organizations in the country team, there were two, at least two that you left out, uh, Peace Corps and the Agency for International Development. I wonder if you could just talk a little about their contributions exactly. and their resources. So the Peace Corps, uh, so the, uh, foreign, uh, the USAID are also part of the Foreign Service. So when we're talking about them, they're also part of, under the Foreign Service Act, they're also part of the Foreign Service team who's overseas. Peace Corps are volunteers, some of the bravest people America has. Um, the bang for the buck from the Peace Corps is absolutely awesome. I know I had a Peace Corps program about 300 when I was um, ambassador to Panama, and I swore in every single class at my house. And I remember having the first lady and the vice president sitting there with me as the Peace Corps people went around and introduced themselves and where they were going and where they'd come from. And they were so absolutely in awe that American kids from very comfortable backgrounds would come to live in a hut without running water and any electricity in order to you know, teach people how to you know, grow, you know, make fish ponds or improve tourism. The Peace Corps is an amazing resource. They, um, they're a treasure as part of something that an ambassador feels. But of course, as you know, we, our relationship with the Peace Corps is at an arm's length because they are volunteers. They are not under that chief of mission authority that Mary talked about. They don't take direction from the ambassador. And we have to be very careful to respect their, um, respect their role because their role, I know in Panama that my Peace Corps volunteers would tell me that if ever they were stopped at a little roadblock you know, where they were taking $20 off of everybody, they would just say cuerpo de paz, and they would just let them through. As soon as you say Peace Corps, it's just like, thank you for being here. Please pass. So they're terrific. And the Agency for International Development is um, talk about underfunded and understaffed. It's really quite a remarkable thing. Um, they are authorized for our 1,850 Foreign Service officers. They have been well under that limit. They've struggled to get hiring restarted under um, Administrator Green. They, um, 
they are all furloughed. There's a whole bunch of them that are furloughed. So the U.S. Agency for International Development, you know, builds bridges. It it um, it, it creates in many cases these uh, enabling frameworks that get rid of corruption and allow local people to have a chance at a fair life, and also American businesses to deliver packages like life-saving medicine. So the Peace Corps and the AID play vitally important roles. AID as foreign service officers and the Peace Corps as some of the world's bravest volunteers. So we are out of time. We could sit and break out our George Cannon action figures and spend the entire afternoon in here asking questions. Um, but I actually have one question for the audience. How many of you were in the Peace Corps? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I want to thank uh, Ambassador Barbara Stevenson, Ambassador Mary Carlin Yates. This is actually one of my favorite great decisions ever because the best thing we can do is pull the curtain back on the process that allows us to understand our role on the global stage and um, in essence getting a little bit of a better picture of how the sausage gets made and this was, <laughs> this was incredible. So oh, thank, thank you, you so thank very, you. very much. So kind. Um, oh, and two more, two more things. Um, uh, so Barbara brought up uh, Bob Kagan's book, The Jungle Grows Back. I heard him speak in D.C. in November. It is an incredible book. The other one I would add to the pile would be Rosa Brooks' book on how the military became everything, or how the war, how war became everything and the military became something. It's a long title. She's Barbara Ehrenreich's daughter. She has spent a career in uh, national security. Those two are really great things to um, set on the uh, nightstand. So thanks. We'll see you next week when we look at a really easy topic like U.S. and Mexico. <laughs>